That is, it's a cognitive bias where people perform poorly on a task, but they don't realize that they're performing poorly because they lack the skills and knowledge to assess themselves accurately. Incompetent people fail to gauge their own incompetence, and thus they fail to make attempts at being at, at self-improvement. In the academic setting, you can say this as poor students overestimate their performance, and good students underestimate theirs. So keep that in mind as you look at all of these theories. Now, the primary colors of cranks. After reading through these, uh, these theories, I very quickly developed a sort of taxonomy of cranks. They basically broke down to three categories. There's the crazy, the naive, and the stubborn. And cranks can have any one or all three of these attributes, but they have at least one. 
And I also, using the term crank, some people don't like the term crank, they think it's too derogatory. Some people prefer the term outsider scientists. They're cranks. <laughs> <laughs> so first, let's talk about the crazy. Some of the things that are sent to us are undoubtedly sent to us by people who have an like, tenuous grasp on the reality. <laughs> For example, this letter. This was sent to us by a guy in Alexandria, Egypt, in the 1990s, where he is um, talking about the abnormal drug injections that are being used against him without any reason. And this is problem is against the law of nations. And he's registered with the United States Court of Appeals. Clearly, paranoid schizophrenic. Also, we had this sent to us by a guy in Ireland. This is the entire note, by the way, that's been sent to us. It says, I am the first person to put forward the theory, enclosed, regarding the tilt of the Earth's axis and the depths, depth of the Earth's magnetic field. And there it is. No. <laughs> Great. I have no idea what he's trying to get at. But it looks nice. And that's another thing we'll notice about these theories, that they often have a very uh, uh, sophisticated aesthetic properties, but scientifically, they're completely bogus. Here's another one. Time, a compressive gravitational force vector affecting every point in space, the force of time pushing down on this poor person's head. Light is a three-dimensional vector. The third dimension is contractive and causes aging. Space absorbs two components of light and one planar perceptual vision. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what any of this stuff means. The fourth dimension, flat, no aging. Space absorbs one component of light, two planar perceptual vision, holographic. And finally, the fifth dimension, expansive and euthening. Space radiates light, three planar perceptual vision. I don't know about you, but I'm convinced. <laughs> Here's uh, another one. This was sent to us as part of a large packet. I got the packet over here. This was sent to us by a guy in Morocco. It's about 50 or 60 pages, mostly in Arabic, containing diagrams like this. Um, you'll notice in the middle, it's probably hard to read this, but this is first, second, third, and it's down to seventh heaven. And so he's noting, noticing that a lot of things come in sevens. You've got the seven layers of the atmosphere here, from troposphere to stratosphere. You've got the seven parts of the eye, seven layers of skin, seven parts of the elementary canal, and so on. Yeah. The Pythagoreans would love this guy. <laughs> Here's a letter. I, this is one of my favorite things in the box, so I should read it in full. Dear Chairman, in 1953 or 4, 54, I talked to the Chairman of the Physics Department in Corvallis, <laughs> Oregon. At that time, I thought that suction could explain all there was to explain. He explained that suction is limited to the atmospheric pressure. Well, since that time, I have realized that what we thought of as suction is not really suction at all. We are only making more room for electrons to bounce around in, or leaving less electrons to bounce around. I say that true suction is a reality. If I am wrong, how do you explain the fact that I was able to tell scientists that everything had an energy field in 1964? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 29 years before I heard it announced on television that everything really did have an energy field. I'm not sure what he means by energy field, but I'll leave that. Uh, electricity is a very useful tool, but it is not an explanation in itself. Electricity itself can be explained. <laughs> True suction needs no explanation because it is not a thing in itself. It is just a way of nature. Everything is relative, and space relative to itself is a solid. If you had a material that was a true solid, you could demonstrate true suction. It requires a true solid to demonstrate true suction. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> go, go back to 1953 and look at the way science believed then compared to what they believe now. I say the universe is dancing to my tune. <laughs> There's more. In 1964, I tried to get a Dr. Hall at Oregon State University to conduct an experiment to prove that everything had an energy field. He said that Einstein had already got the same results by using rotating mirrors, and that it was not unusual for someone to reinvent something. The rotating mirrors thing, I have no idea what he's talking about. Einstein didn't do any experiments as far as I know he was a theorist. Uh, I was not inventing anything. I just knew from my theory that everything should have an energy field and that such an experiment should get that result. He became disgusted with me because I would not go along with Einstein. <laughs> but people are also very fixated on Einstein. <laughs> if science continues to use electricity as a basis for everything, they will be headed for a dead end. Also, science needs to realize that we do not experience time or see things in a true perspective. I strongly suspect that what we think of as very small is in reality very large. Do you really believe that science has now seen the smallest possible particle? 
Many years ago, I read that science had said that if the universe were to shrink to the size of a grapefruit, we could not tell the difference between, because everything would have shrunk proportionally. An inch would still measure an inch, and a mile still measure a mile. You have to realize that the opposite of this would also have to be true. What if a grapefruit was in reality the size of our visible universe? It now becomes easy to see why we keep seeing smaller and smaller particles. In ending, I would like to say that I believe we have a very small window of what you say this. <laughs> A uh, clinical psychologist would probably look at this and say, this guy is schizophrenic because he's making loose associations between a lot of things and not making sense of any of them. Also, the, that last bit about saving civilization, that's also something you see a lot of, a lot of Messianic people in the box. All right. This is another uh, letter by the same guy. Um, he's a little long with us. He was in his 90s when he sent that to us. Um, he has a thousand dollar reward, proof that gravity is not a pulse, and he has a list of things, of different theories, I won't go through all of them. But I will mention that he does have true suction in there. <laughs> um, and also, please save for posterity. Done and done. <laughs> okay, so, enough of the crazy. The naive. People who have de generally not had any science education or have not had any science education in a long time. For example, this letter was sent to us from a, a uh, retirement community in Texas. If you consider the Earth's gravitational field as one, our planet Jupiter is about a 12. And there are probably more large, much larger planets in our universe. Would you consider the periodic table of elements and also molecular compounds could be more than 200 elements plus that we have on Earth? Just asking, thank you. <laughs> Love is anywhere. Here's another one. We know there are magnetic fields, and they would explain everything if this was the only case, but it's not. <laughs> every planet, moon, every mass in space has gravity. Yeah. If it did not, it would mass together, and the atoms would be free floating in space. A, like atoms, are held together through quantum physics. Once mass, they may collect masses of other atoms by accidents until planets are built and formed. Okay. The sun and solar system, period. The force that holds this together might equal the force the sun radiates. Uh -huh. Feeding the sun's fuel may be the source of its gravity, and then a billion ton star can be held in orbit with a kite spur. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is word sound. Uh, another example of what I call concept mixing. Electricity is found in three forms, my knowledge. Raw electric charge as lightning, as it is found in light, and it is found to be magnetic flux. All travel at the same speed, normally at the speed of light. This gives them a common denominator. It's not unlike the stages of water, in which you have ice, water, and steam from the same unit. Again, three things, three other things, they must be connected somehow. It is a known fact that permanent magnets lose their strength over a period of time, thus dispelling the perpetual motion theory. <laughs> the loss would probably end up being in the half-life method and the carbon atom. Okay, <laughs> so we have some of that, but the third category, or color, is probably the most interesting and also, in some ways, the most disturbing, and those are the stubborn. Those are the people who actually are educated, but still have these weird theories. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to be playing the bits from an episode of This American Life about one such person named Bob. This is from episode 293. You can, you can listen to the whole thing online for free. Um, so let me just play the first bit of this. Away from the ring, and with extra time in his hands, he has an idea for an invention, a superconductor of some sort. Bob's a tinkerer, great with car engines, computers, any kind of electronics. But to build something as ambitious as a superconductor, he needed to go back and study basic physics, something he hadn't done since high school. So I sat down. Got up and I started reading. Of course, I never got to the image because I found something else. Something that I couldn't understand, couldn't resolve. I think something much more important because it's something every Nobel Prize winning physicist missed. That something, he said, was the most significant development in physics in a century. I discovered that uh, physics is fundamentally operating off an incorrect principle. And the principle is that E equals MC squared. That's wrong. 
without question. Gives you long answers every time they use it. I guarantee it. Bob believed he disproved Einstein's theory of relativity, and that's why he got back in touch with me. I'm a journalist. Bob said he needed my help drafting a book about his findings. He said the book would make him famous. He said it would make us both rich. Bob suggested we call the book E Does Not Equal MC Square. <laughs> we'll hear more from Bob later. <laughs> so, um, the stubborn send in often theories of everything. Here's a few of them. The Universal Physics Theory. Wow. I'm going to check that over here. This is a full book, bound. It's got illustrations being uh, sent to us as a possible textbook to be using in our classes. You've also got the New Gravity, which uh, is this one. Uh, we've got the Grand Unified Theory of Physics. This is hard cover. And we've got the universe, the whole universe, in a 54-page pamphlet. And <laughs> okay. Um, as you can probably tell, one of the uh, the basic uh, attitudes is self-grandizing. That is, they think very highly of themselves. They think they have stumbled upon something truly remarkable and revolutionary. This is a, a excerpt from a letter that was sent to us by a guy who claims to have a PhD in what he didn't say. That the SSC, the super, like the super Collider, this is back in the old 90s, is now officially dead. There's good reason for its death. With my final theory of everything, there's no need for an SSC to find the answers for ultimate reality. After a long and intense campaign, the support for SSC in the <coughs> physics community drops to zero. My final theory of everything triumphs. <laughs> and he uh, was good enough to send along some pictures of himself at a conference in Moscow, a philosophy conference in Moscow, where he presented a talk on, uh, on his theories, and he got a nice little plaque, and that's his website, which is still active, so you can check it out yourself to see what he's on about. Uh, another th common thing is that the lack of disproof of the theories proves that they are true. Here is an uh, excerpt from a letter sent to us, dear sir. You should be aware that your department is teaching the outmoded paradigm of particle physics and quantum mechanics. I realize your first reaction to this statement is to categorize it as that of an unbalanced individual or a crackpot, if you please, but hear me out. Okay. In close is a six-page monograph outlining a few of the essential points of a new paradigm arising from a paper entitled On the Quantum as a Physical Entity. This theory, published 1988, has never been challenged or disproved. Therefore, by default, it stands as a new physics. <laughs> this is it, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, there's a, a, a great little line here at the end, which I want to mention here. Um, it never ceases to amaze me that those who are unable to figure out something on their own stubbornly resist or ignore the answer when it is handed to them a fait accompli. How ironic. <laughs> Here's uh, some from the universe, uh, a couple of pages from the universe. Most of the universe is like this, pages of just numbers. <laughs> Notice the number of digits here. Now, um, as far as I know, the physicists in the crowd can, can uh, correct me on this, but the most accurate, most precisely measured value uh, of all is the electron moment, uh, the dipole moment of the electron, which is known to about 15 digits. You can see that these are running to 30, 40, sometimes 50 digits. So this is just numerology. Also, this was sent to us. Um, this is a, just a piece of blue cardboard. <laughs> Folded in half, there's no return address. And you can see this just a list of things. We've got the elementary charge as m over k. I have no idea what m over k are supposed to be. But it's also e over v, n over r, and s over c. And uh, the numbers are almost exactly the same. That one's one with an infinite number of zeros and then a one at the end. <laughs> this one doesn't have a one at the end, so I guess that's slightly different. This one has an infinite number of nines, and this one has an infinite number of zeros of the one at the end. So I guess E is different for the different cases. And then you have things, you know, magnetic flux is a real thing, and so is electric resistance, but I have no idea what uh, mass invariant or kinematic viscosity is supposed to mean. But uh, we now know their values, thanks to this guy. 
Also, the year is very strange. <laughs> maybe that's the rest mass. Maybe that is. Or hard suction. Rest mass is something. Alright, we have the uh, uh, driving fundamental constants is very common among people in the box. It is trying to put together disparate numbers in order to derive other constants of nature. For example, g, which uh, physics students may recognize as the universal gravitational constant uh, from Newton's theory of gravity, um, he uh, represents in terms of a product of various things, like h bar, which is the Planck constant, which is uh, ubiquitous in quantum mechanics, and you have the speed of light, and you got the rest mass of an electron. And if you do put these numbers together, and I checked this on my calculator, if you do put these numbers together, you do get the correct value, the numerical value for big G. And the units are correct as well. So what's the problem here? Well, it's right there. Yeah. Why is he choosing one second? There's nothing universal about the second. It's a human invention. You see this a lot. Another thing which is a sort of fixation of uh, people in the box is the fine structure constant because it's one of the few things in physics which has no units. It does not depend on what units you're using. Fine structure constant is known to be 1 over 137. Um, interestingly, a little historical uh, side here, the great uh, scientist Eddington in the early uh, 20th century who was uh, instrumental in making uh, uh, relativity understandable to the layman, um, was also a bit of a crackpot himself um, he thought that the fine structure constant should be exactly 1 over 136 because that was, the no, that was the measured value at the time. And he thought for numerological reasons that should be exactly 1 over 136. Then later uh, experiments show that they're a little bit off. It's actually 1 over 137. You can see it's almost very nearly 1 over 137. And so he said, no, it's exactly 1 over 137. And so his Eddington after that was called Ed Adding one. Ah. <laughs> but anyway, so the uh, fine structure constant has this numerical value. It's known to at least 10 digits, by the way. I'm just showing the first six. In the new gravity, everything in the universe is accelerating at 2.8 angstroms per second squared. Accelerating which way, they don't say. But it's just accelerating at 2.8 angstroms per second squared. And if you take that number multiplied by one second, there's the one second again, and multiplied by the speed of light squared, you get 0 0.00702, which is pretty close to the fine structure constant. As can be seen, the differences are close enough to give serious consideration to more simple <laughs> form. Sure. So I guess having one digit in common is enough to base a whole theory. Another uh, person who's, who's uh, into the fine structure constant is this guy. The universal physics theory guy, <laughs> that everything in the universe is made out of tiny particles called brutinos. <laughs> now, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is ubiquitous uh, amongst, especially what are known as ether theorists. There's people who believe in the luminiferous ether that is the so called uh, medium through which light travels, um, which was abandoned back around 1900 or so by most scientists, but still, some people still hold on to it stubbornly, including this guy. And so he thinks that the ether is made out of these things called rutinos, and that's uh, the hierarchy of the particles. The rutinos okay. make neutrinos, which make protons, which make electrons. Um, how that jives with electric charge, I'm not really sure, but whatever. So he knows what, he knows what the mass is, 10 by 66 kilograms. He knows their diameter. He knows their density. And he knows the mean free path. It's about the size of a nucleus. And they form this ether gas with a classical maxwell boltzmann distribution. Now you might say, well, how does he know all this? He obviously can't measure things that are that small. So what's his evidence? Well, here's his evidence. This is the uh, molecular spin <coughs> distribution in a gas. This has been known since the 1950s. Um, it's called the maxwell boltzmann distribution, or Maxwell distribution. Um, so what we have here is the number of particles in the gas at particular speeds. Okay, so some of them are moving slow, some of them are moving <coughs> fast, most of them are somewhere in the middle, and it follows this functional relationship, which depends on the temperature and the mass and so on. Now there's three particular velocities which are of interest if you're a physics student. One is the peak velocity, that is where you see the peak of this graph. One is the average velocity, that is we take the average of all the speeds, 
and the other is called the root mean square or RMS velocity. And those are given by those three formulas there. All right. So what this guy did was he noticed that if you took the VRMS and divided by the average, subtracted one and then squared it, you get this number. And if you compute that number, you get 0.00729348, which is pretty close to the fine structure constant. The first three digits definitely match up. We thus suspected that the square root of this number might be the velocity coupling ratio for the electromagnetic field. And this was the starting point of his entire theory. In fact, when you get these books from these folks, all you need to do is read the first three or four pages. That's, that's where they bring out their big idea, and the rest is just commentary on that big idea, trying to fit it into every possible physics uh, uh, pigeonhole you can think of. On his bookshelves, alongside hockey trophies and framed photos of his daughters, stand copies of Physics to Mystify, Trigonometry to Mystify, and Calculus to Mystify. Physics is simple, he says. It's the physics community, academia, that mystifies him. All right, I, at this point I have to be completely honest. I did write a paper early on, and I submitted it to a, uh, a physics site, and it was summarily rejected out of hand. But I did learn an important lesson that physicists and what's being done by them is very complicated, very mathematically intensive. What I've got is none of that. So it's <laughs> completely, almost in reverse, goes over their head. <laughs> we have an arrow. This arrow represents force. A big letter F there. In a nutshell, Bob believes Einstein misunderstood the relationship between energy and time. Bob insists the error is self explanatory, obvious, but whenever he's tried to show me his reasoning, I don't see it. I can tell if I'm confused or if Bob's confused. Times of philosophy, it's actually it should be mass time speed. It's a mathematical thing, it's no big deal. Unless you're a physicist and you're focused on that. It's an exclusion of the truth. Alright, so if we look at the mass time So, um, as often uh, you'll see the case in the box, when uh, presented with something that they don't understand, which is all the time, um, they simply redefine the terms to things they do understand. So, for example, in this book, uh, Fundamental Thermodynamics at the Micro Level, by the way, $50 yeah, at the good bookstore. Is <laughs> and uh, about six pages of this is a long poem, by the way. <laughs> um, it says, in my discussion of particle thermodynamics, I'll treat temperature as energy density that's expressed in joules. And entropy will be a dimensionless number, which is the ratio of two lengths, and is therefore a geometrical parameter. Mm -hmm. It's specifically required that no distortion or misrepresentation of the parameter of time will be permissible. Thus, in this study, it is strictly forbidden to use the major portion of the special theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. Relativity gets a lot of enemies in this box. And uh, here's one of his equations, equation three. Again, temperature and energy, same thing. And the new gravity is even more egregious. <clears throat> the whole argument to be made for the new gravity is simply that mass is here being redefined. That whereas a body's inertial and gravitational mass have always been classically represented to mean their total mass, we instead proclaim a body's gravitational mass to be only the body's, body's column mass. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, column mass <coughs> is equal to the density, okay, times the mean radius, okay. <laughs> times one meter squared, there's the one again. <laughs> and so for Earth, the column mass it turns out to be 3.5 times 10 to the 10 kilograms. And if you take that number and you multiply it by the 2.6 angstroms per second squared that I mentioned before, you get 9.8 newtons, which is the weight of one kilogram. <laughs> the force pulling at each kilogram of mass resting upon the Earth's surface is due to the equivalent outside force constantly pushing the Earth through space at the speed of light. <laughs> All right. And also in the same book regarding units, that we need to put labels on everything and can, if we wish, do without them as long as we make clear what we are saying. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> now, a lot of the things that come from the box are from engineers, especially retired engineers. 
Um, very few from people in the natural sciences or from mathematics or other technical disciplines. Engineers are disproportionately represented in the box. <laughs> and it's not just the box. They're common among all sorts of fringe science communities. For example, creationists. Uh, back in the 90s, people on Usenet uh, came up with something called the Salem Hypothesis, which is that if you're having a conversation with someone about evolution versus creation, and you're talking to a creationist, and they claim to have scientific expertise, they will invariably be an engineer. Also, conspiracy theorists. Many people in conspiracy theorist communities are engineers, especially 9-11 Truth Group. The Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth has over a thousand members that are engineers and architects. Apocalyptic cults. For example, the uh, devotees of, of um, uh, Harold Camden, the guy who predicted that the Earth would, uh, would, would uh, be destroyed last year. Many, many engineers among his devotees. And, of course, cranks. Now, I have no idea why engineers are so disproportionate. They're much more prevalent in these communities than, say, physicists or geologists, or even computer scientists. In particular, engineers seem to have this sort of quirk. Oh, that is an unanswered question. Now, can they be reasoned with? Can you talk them out of their theories? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> Dr. Watson said Bob's work was riddled with the kind of mistakes a freshman physics student would make in his first week of class. No, he corrected it with the kind of mistakes a freshman sociology student did in physics elected. He said Bob's big error was repeatedly confusing momentum with energy, which apparently, in physics, is a big deal. I relate this to Bob, thinking that would be the end of it. Yeah, Bob didn't waver. He remained so earnest and so obstinate that I arranged for Bob and Dr. Watson to meet face to face. I thought it would be a quick meeting that Dr. Watson would turn Bob around. I was wrong. I do not say momentum is the same thing as kinetic energy. Oh, no. No. He did about 10 times in that paper, and I marked every one of them. No, 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 10 times in your paper. Well, I, I don't want to get into that part of it because... That's the that part of it. That's what we do it into first. As physicists, the first thing we, we check is the units. If the units are wrong, then F is equal to oranges, which we don't accept. That's a very efficient way to find out somebody's wrong or not. That's how we do it. I understand that, and... <laughs> now, that's not the issue. The issue is... The court was never reached. Bob and Dr. Watson's frustration with each other devolved into the main column. In fact, I have to mention this. I know the hallmark of schizophrenia is they get a good idea and then they, that's, they never investigate whether it's right or not. Okay? I think the Asian. Are you calling Bob a schizophrenic? No, you have to watch out for this kind of thing because some people may think that. <laughs> Finally, Bob, defined as always, falling back with what all along has been his main point. E equals mc squared doesn't make sense because it's difficult to understand. The fundamental law of physics should be self explanatory. Well, the only thing I can see with, with physics is you get way too complicated. I mean, you have to go to school forever. You have to know this outrageous uh, amount of uh, calculus thing. When, when I see all that, I know that you know, physics has gone off the rails. You know why it looks so difficult? There's tons of point at which you can see beyond the gap that you'll never cross the gap. You just can't do it. No matter how hard you try, you can't do it. Okay, especially when you got to the conclusion. Einstein was wrong, it should be E equals MC, I guess, instead of MC squared. If you used MC, there would have been no A bomb on Hiroshima. We don't have radios, we don't have lasers, we don't have atomic bombs, we don't have anything. No cell phone, no microwave, no nothing, man. We don't have anything. It should be noted that many of these people, especially the stubborn ones, have been working on their theories for decades, and they're not going to give them up easily. How come Brent can't persuade you that you're wrong? Well, it was, this is not really fair, but I'm going to say it. It's like he was talking the party line. Um, he's not really, he didn't strike me as being all that bright. Uh, well, I know he has a couple of patents and he's a big professor, and I, it's probably not fair me, for me to say that, but I'm not claiming to be this incredible genius in this one. Area. It's, it's very simple what I went into, and I I need some help to get maybe it put into a form where people can understand. 
but it really isn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. So, why bother? Why bother uh, researching these guys? Why bother reading through all this stuff? Well, teaching physics is about correcting misconceptions people have about the natural world. When students come into my class, they are not blank slates. They have probably an Aristotelian way of looking at the world that really requires you know, a force or a move in and things like that. And we have to break them of these misconceptions before they become permanent. And they will become permanent if they're not addressed. Crank theories, like the ones I've been talking about, are sort of the terminal or advanced or tertiary stage of misconception. And we can use crank theories as object lessons to show conceptual dead ends and show how to back out of them. That is, immunization against bad ideas. Immunization, and I mean it in a very specific way, immunization is the introduction of a weakened form of a disease into the body so that the body can adapt to it and fight the stronger disease later. With crank theories, these are extremely weak scientific arguments. And the process of picking apart scientific arguments strengthens one's own uh, uh, resistance to misconception here. That is, learning through failure, specifically their failure. Here's an example of a, uh, uh, such an object lesson, which I gave in my Physics 141 class. Those of you who are in physics, um, take a look at that and see if you can figure out what the error is. So we have centripetal force. This is the formula which you learned in Physics 141, and v squared over r, v is the velocity, r is the radius, and is the mass. And f equals ma, that's the second law, a is dv dt, so the f is then dv dt, so far so good. And he has this picture here of something going in a circular path. It goes from v that way to v that way. And therefore, the object's differential velocity goes from plus v to minus v right there. That's where the error is. Mm -hmm. This guy does not understand calculus. Mm -hmm. right? And so everything after that is completely bogus, saying that the final force is 2 over pi in v squared over r. And therefore, centripetal force the Newton's centripetal force equation errors by this factor. And this, again, is in the first few pages of his book. Mm -hmm. And this is what he bases his entire cosmogony. So we can also use some of these some bad science like this as homework problems. Mm -hmm. Can the students figure out what's wrong? For example, homeopathy. You take a certain amount of arsenic and dissolve it in water, you dilute it by a factor of a thousand, how many atoms will, will remain, or sorry, hundred, how many atoms will remain? If you dilute it by 30 more preparations, how many atoms remain? If you do the numbers, you get about 10 to the minus 31 atoms, which means that the answer is zero. Another one is autodynamics. This is another crank theory from the 1950s, which was intended to be a, uh, a rival to special relativity. And there are a few people who still um, cotton to it, um, where these are the new transformation equations between x of the moving frame and the non-moving frame. And so I gave a problem showing that the speed of a light being in one frame is not the speed of light in the other frame, which is counter to experiment. But I think what really needs to be done is to actually have a course. That is a course in being able to tell science from pseudoscience. That is, to teach formal and informal fallacies, like confirmation bias especially. Study case studies and self-deception when people don't realize that they're fooling themselves. And developing these skills for self-assessment and for self-criticism, something which is completely absent from the people in the box. And because, especially for the stubborn uh, people I talked about, it's not that they don't know anything. Some of them have advanced degrees in science. So it's not a lack of education that's the problem. It's the attitude towards the knowledge itself that needs to be addressed. And a few books that could be used, for example, the popular one by James Randi from the 70s called Flim Flam, which was instrumental in my development when I was a teenager. Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World from the 1990s, and most recently, Jonathan Kay's Among the Truthers, among the, about the Nile and Truth movement. All of these could be used to teach freshmen and sophomore uh, students about how not to think. <laughs> And for further reading, uh, I recommend this book, which just came out a few months ago, called Physics on the Fringe, which is about crank scientists. Particularly this guy down in the corner here, his name is James Carter, who has developed a uh, theory called the Sirkhan theory 
of atomic structure, nuclear structure, where everything is made out of little rings, not to be confused with superstring theory. But uh, he's developed an entire periodic table made out of these interlinking rings. I mean, aesthetically, it's beautiful. Scientifically, it's bogus. It's very mechanistic. They're, think they're thinking of the universe as being a bunch of Lego blocks that you put together. It doesn't work that way. And also, there is a, uh, the cranks are starting to organize. Um, <laughs> they, they generally work uh, alone. But there is a group called the Natural Philosophy of Things that have conferences and everything, and journals and so on, where people can present their works in, uh, in outsider science. So you can check out that website if you're interested in seeing what they're up to. Now, a little epilogue. Who are these guys? And I do emphasize guys, because I did not see one female name in the box, which I think is interesting. Um, so the guy who invented the new gravity, created the new gravity, the 2.8 uh, angstroms per second squared, you can see that right there, is the inventor of the candlelight flashlight. The grand unified theory of physics, the Brutino guy, he has a PhD in engineering from Purdue, and he taught at Mississippi State University for over 20 years. And the guy who wrote fundamental thermodynamics at the micro level, that's uh, this book again. You can see his resume, very impressive, MS in electrical engineering, vice president of ITT avionics, later became the corporate vice president of ITT, and retired in 1982. And from his obituary, he, uh, after 17 years, he jogged 70,000 miles and published five books of basic particle physics technical books that questioned some generally accepted scientific theories. I understand Bob Stone's this one. Since he was a kid, he was going off and reading books and figuring out things on his own. When he was 12, he taught himself how to construct an FM transmitter from spare parts, building a coil of himself. <laughs> He's a self-taught auto mechanic and a self-taught television repairman, too. Almost everything he knows about electrical work, he learned from books. He's based his whole life on the idea that he can figure out things on his own. Technical stuff that, to most of us, seems just as hard as E equals MC squared. No wonder he thinks he can trust his own judgment on this one. It's a hard habit to break. It's hard for him to see himself any other way. As the end of Bob's sabbatical neared, I had asked his wife, Celia, about the possibility that Bob wouldn't even acknowledge. What would it mean in the big picture if Bob is totally wrong? I think it would be a huge blow to his ego. It wouldn't change anything for me as far as how I feel about him. I mean, he'd still be Bob, and he'd still be the man I love, and I'd still be in love with him. You gotta love him, man. So either love him or hate him. It's like, you know, he can be an arrogant son of a bitch, and you you live with the good and the bad. Because there's more, there's there's so much more to him than that. So thanks to the caretakers of the box, the uh, various department uh, heads since mm -hmm. the 90s. Um, after I leave, it'll be bestowed upon Tom Gutierrez, who will hopefully add to it even more. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> They, well, I mean, I haven't been to the conferences, so I don't really know. Um, they tend not to criticize each other's work. Um, although I've, I've heard that um, at that comp at that alliance, that the ether theorists are sort of the big dogs. They're the ones who sort of control the agenda. Um, like this this guy that I mentioned before, uh, Jim Carter, that the physics on the fringe thing was about the circle on theory. He's considered an outsider among them. Um, and so they are, they are not very happy with the fact that he's been getting this publicity since this book came out. So, but um, yeah, they tend not to criticize each other's work very much. Very much unlike real scientists. Yes? Has any good come out of it? Has anything good come out of it? Anything good? Besides energy? <laughs> <laughs> um, not that I'm aware. Yeah. One thing that's kind of interesting, and the APS has a rule that uh, you can submit a uh, abstract, and, and they're not reviewed. 
That's right. And so every meeting or two, there'll be one or two abstracts that are really off the wall. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's horrible science, but we, we go ahead and publish it like, like we should. <laughs> yes. Well, at the, um, the March meeting, which is the uh, one of the main eight, uh, American Physical Society conferences, um, there is a, uh, a special section for the cranks called General Physics. There's also one for the cold fusion guys. There's still people doing cold fusion. Um, they don't call it cold fusion anymore. They've rebranded it. That's the same stuff. Um, but the general physics uh, section, they have their own part of the, uh, of the, of the bulletin. And um, there are some people who only publish, their, their, their only publishing record is what they've published in the bulletin. So when they do references, they do references to previous bulletins as they're, for the literature search. Yeah. Any idea how these people decide to send these things to Cal Poly of all places? Well, they send it to everyone. Okay. Yeah, um, a lot of the time, um, they just mass blanket email. Some of them are from former students, so there's a personal connection there. Some are, you know, um, I know one or two of them actually sent photocopies of their diploma, and of course they were engineering students. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, a lot of them are locals. Um, there's one guy uh, who's a serial killer who's been sending stuff to us for decades, Carl Werner. Um, he's over in the uh, California Men's Colony. He sent stuff to us every couple of years. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a mixture. Um, some of it's completely out of the blue, like the guy from Ireland. For yeah, was kind of <laughs> We had kind of an interesting thing happened locally. There was a guy with a PhD in, I think, geology. And he had managed, the, the AAAS meetings have smaller regional meetings. And somehow he got on the list that he was able to run sessions. And so he ran anti-Einstein sessions. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess people didn't understand what was going on. But you know, he went ahead and did it. And so he wanted to speak at our physics colloquium. And I, I, I said, no, 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 I don't think I want to. But then finally he kept bugging me so much. He kept coming back. You guys aren't honorable. You won't, you won't take outside opinions. So, so I said, OK, buddy, we'll do it. And, uh, and uh, he gave the talk, and as far as I'm concerned, he got chopped up in small pieces. But it was all, but it was all very gentlemanly. Right. Nobody, we never said anything bad about him, and we gave him a mic. Right. Um, I'd be interested to know, because um, the guy who, was, who started the Natural, Natural Philosophy Alliance, that, that uh, organization I mentioned before, is from San Luis Obispo. Oh, is he kind of a biggish guy? Uh, I don't know. Self, I, I don't know. Have like I don't look at. He's not. He's not with us anymore. Um, okay. But. Um, I'd have to look at his name, I don't remember his name, but it'd be interesting to know if it was the same guy. Yeah. Are the engineers, is there like a particular discipline that's like... Is it like mechanical engineers, or electrical engineers? How much is it worth to you? <laughs> uh, uh, I would say probably electrical. Uh. Electrical? <laughs> Well, the thing is that um, when it comes to physics before 1900, everyone's on board. It's only like, you know, from 1905 on, from, from Einstein's theory of relativity, basic quantum mechanics, that's where they have problems. And, uh, you know, some engineering students don't have to take to physics 211 where you learn about things like quantum mechanics and relativity. They, they pick it up piecemeal from, from popular media and such. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just a lack of training. Uh, in you know understanding what the arguments are for why we think relativity is right, and so they sort of learn it on the web, and there's lots and lots of cranky stuff on the web as we know. Yeah. When I was in the government, we had a boss like that. I was with the Department of Energy, and all sorts of stuff would come in, and the boss was perfect for that. But consider yourself lucky because sometimes in the government they would write to a congressman or senator. And that person would send the letter to us, and then it would get logged in with a number and a due date. And uh, you had to prepare a response. And they really didn't care what you said, 
<laughs> Except they didn't really want you to say you're, you're crazy, we completely disagree with you because the copy was going to the senator or the congressman. And this would sometimes set up this, this sort of back and forth because if you respond, then sometimes the writer would, would in turn issue another letter. So I think the box is the perfect way to do it. Luckily, yeah. thankfully, we have academic freedom. <laughs> Is there one, like maybe, excerpt of a paper or a letter that really stood out to you as being? Oh, it's like choosing your favorite child. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the true suction taper is really one of my favorites. That, that, is, a, that is a symphony of bullshit. <laughs> but, yeah, there's so many to choose from. I, I, I couldn't really. I mean, it really depends what. What you, what you like? Do you, do you like stuff which looks that looks good, but when you actually investigate it, it's completely, it completely falls apart? Or the stuff which is completely off the wall and completely uh, visionary? You know, like <laughs> like for example, the Seven Heavens. Um, that uh, actually, I can show you from the uh, this packet that was sent to us, just so you can see some of it. Um, I mean, it is. Got lots and lots of diagrams. It's all Xerox, you know. It's it's mostly in Arabic too. So. Sorry. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of brains and body parts, and there's Linus for some reason. <laughs> so it it kind of depends what uh, what your flavor of weirdness is. Do do any of these people? Are they all theorists? Do any of them try to experimentally prove their...? Um, it, there's not much uh, talk of experiment. Um, a lot of it is just speculation. I mean, you think, you, speculation. you think engineers would have that empirical, at least the tinkerer instinct, to try to put something together? Well, I mean, some of the stuff that they're thinking about, I don't think they could design an experiment to test it. Mm. So. I think the jury's still out. I think a true liquid might be able to. Uh, do, uh, is a true solid required for true liquid? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think you can get some funding. Yeah, I'll send you some. Yeah. Uh, just a response to the previous question. I mean, you think that engineers would. Uh, Look for the Google evidence, but there's lots of great minds in Cal Poly that have some uh, interesting theories about uh, evolution and how uh, things work in the world that are that all connected to science. I don't think being an engineer. Are you, are you talking about in the engineering department? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, I know lots of engineers that don't necessarily take into wow. account proven science. So I don't think being an engineer necessarily means. There is a, I, I did see a study, it's, it's an old study, so it may not be true anymore, but I saw a study from the 80s that um, um, engineers tend to be more religious and more politically conservative than people in the natural sciences, for whatever reason. Does, does the marks precede like, physics slash religion? Uh, a bit, yeah. There's some religious stuff, not that, not too much. People in biology get it much more than we do. Why don't we invite some of these people on campus to give talks? <laughs> I say that seriously, to see them in action and to see how they actually work through the stuff. Just let the students, faculties back off and let the students engage with it. Uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, uh, students at MIT invited uh, Gene Ray. Gene Ray yes. your, uh, time time to do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they, they paid for him to come out and give a talk, and I'm sure uh, that was brilliant. That could be uh, part of the pseudoscience course. I, I think it's <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, time to It's gold. Look it up. Was that like the great movie? Yeah. The, 
No. The, the, the important thing is that it's an anti Semitic conspiracy, by the way. Okay? You've been educated stupid. Right? <laughs> the, the, the important thing with such a discussion is not only for the students to realize that it's bullshit, but be able to explain why it's bullshit. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the key thing. Are all of the cranks wrong, or do you get people who are trivially right? They're, they're proving things, but they're, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're getting the right equations, but they're, they're doing them in, in sort of ridiculous ways. Well, they definitely cherry pick the, uh, the stuff that they use. Uh, for example, they'll, some of them will just assume E equals MC squared, while some of them think, you know, of course E does not equal MC squared, you know, but I have this new theory. But you know, if they have a theory, they're happy to you know, supplant it with known science without having any respect for why their theory doesn't, uh, is completely incommensurate with the science that has gone before. It's a complete disconnect. They're just using the equations. You know, really but not. you get people who are, you know, like, I mean, that just don't apply Occam's razor. So everything that they, all the answers are correct. I mean, you can say that, you know, you know, gravity is 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 fairies pushing down on everything, and you, you know, or like the epi, you know, the the epicycles in, in in Ptolemy's theories. Right. They all get the right answer. Yes, that's why people believe in them. Yeah. So long. Um, but it's not the most and parsimonious fact, way. And in fact, Copernicus's theory when it first came out was worse than the epicycles theory. Yeah. So do you get, as well. So do you get Ptolemies that are are sort of saying, yeah, I agree with all of physics answers, but my way of doing it is much prettier or something. Well, I mean, it's very selectively pretty. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's basically a bunch of just-so stories. You know, they, they are sort of, uh, you know, like I said, cherry-picking stuff in order to supplant their whole theory. Mm -hmm. But they, they have no context. They can't put it in context with you know, the larger scientific world. They don't understand what the consequences of their theory are. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a great example of this. Um, one of the theories I've seen is, it has to do with something called the principle of equivalence. Now, those of you who don't take physics, I'll just explain it very briefly. So, imagine that um, you have uh, you've, you you wake up one one morning and you're in a strange room, okay? And there's no windows, but there's a light so you can see. And all you have um, around you is you have a ball and you have a ruler and you have a stopwatch. So, you have nothing to do but measure the acceleration due to gravity. So, <laughs> here you are in your room, and you got your ball, and you drop the ball, and you measure, you measure how far it falls, and you measure the time it takes, and you do this for several different drops, and you know a little bit of physics, and so you calculate the acceleration due to gravity, and you calculate to be 9.8 meters per second squared, and so you say, okay, great, I'm on Earth, I'm okay. <laughs> then a window opens, and you suddenly realize that you're not actually in a room on Earth, you're actually in a rocket ship going through space, which is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. So it's not that the ball is being accelerated towards the ground, the ground is being accelerated up towards the ball. So let's say that here's the ball, maintains the same position. So according to you, the ball fell, you hit the ground, but, but actually what happened, looking from the outside world, is that it went high. That's the principle of the That's sort of the, the starting point for the special theory, of, so the general theory of relativity. So one of the theories I've seen um, is that our sensation of gravity on the surface of the Earth is actually due to that effect, that the Earth is expanding at 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay. So now I gave this to my physics 141 students, saying, "What's wrong with it?" And I got lots of great responses. For example, if the Earth were indeed expanding at 20 meters per second squared, that means that the distance between me and you would be getting bigger, right? Okay. And like you know, the distance between here and and LA would be getting bigger over time. So it should take longer to fly to LA next week than it did the week before, and so on. But you can even, you know, actually do it mathematically to figure out, okay, well, if the Earth is expanding at 9.8 meters per second squared, that means that in the past it was smaller than it is now. Now, the smallest it could be is a point. So if it started from a point and expanded outward at 9.8 meters per second squared, how long would it take in order to achieve its current size? The answer turns out to be about 19 minutes. 
<laughs> so just a simple physics 141 exercise completely shows that this theory is bullshit. Yet, a crank will never do that calculation because it's due to too disquieting. They don't, they don't want to be proved wrong. They, when, they, when, they, when, they, when they contact us, they're not interested in dialogue. They're interested in confirmation. They think they have special information. They're convinced they have special information. They just want us to confirm their genius. They believe in what I call the lone genius model of scientific progress. That is, that science progresses because, progresses because of individual effort, because of a Galileo or an Einstein or a Heisenberg or what have you. They don't realize that science doesn't work like that. It's communal. It's organic. It develops through argument amongst many people. I don't think that effect exists only in engineering. <laughs> <laughs> sure doesn't. Yeah. So an interesting cousin to all of this, of, of which I can only one example, is the Adam Sobel yeah, that's good. Yes. Where the Follow you. surgeons were done on purpose. Mm -hmm. Any comment about that? Um, that's just uh, people not being skept skeptical enough uh, and not realizing that you know, something is not scientific. So, is that the thing that you Yes, yes. Something that's probably more along this line is the recent live paper by uh, Eric Lindsay. He's got a case Western University of Biochemist. He came up with this very, very cranky paper uh, mm -hmm. earlier in the year, which actually got published in an online journal and caused um, many people, um, a few people on, on the board to resign because it was so bizarre. Some cranky stuff does get here to play at 7 to 9. Thank you. Yeah, that was flawed. Didn't he do a good job? He was extremely good. You all look at least 15% smarter. Yeah. Yeah, really, I would have loved it if he could have gotten a He wanted to stay here. He wanted to stay here? Yeah, yeah, we just didn't have a position. Do you have a house? No, he's a single guy. <laughs>